Wes. And today is a video that has been a long time in the making. But first, I wanted to give you a quick message. I know that about 90% of the people that watch my videos are not subscribed. I would really love it if you subscribed. I hate asking for likes and subscribes. It drives me crazy, but I'm slowly trying to make a living here and subscriptions, likes, shares, comments, that stuff all help. That's enough of that, let's get into it. We're talking about the Godox transmitters. The X-series transmitters, as some might call them, or if you're an Adorama fan, the R2-series flashpoint transmitters. So essentially, we have four to choose from. Some of them look pretty similar, some of them look pretty different. But how do you decide which one to get? Depending on what market you're in, your decision might be made for you to some extent. Our options here are the X1T, the X2T, the X-Pro-S, and the R2 Pro 2, also known as the X-Pro 2. Why do we have so many to choose from? In a way, it's nice. In a way, it is confusing, unnecessarily so. Because this one here is the old one. It is the X1T, kind of the original from the X-Series. And this is where you get your basics. And then Godox came out with the X-Pro. You get a bigger screen, some would say a more user-friendly design, and then they updated the X1 series to an X2, has more features, and then once again, we have another update to the Pro series to this guy. We're gonna take a deep, deep dive into this stuff. On the surface, there is a lot that is very similar about these, but we're gonna go in really deep to power management, to distance transmission, everything that you could imagine. So sit tight, strap in, we're gonna get real nerdy here. So the first thing we have to talk about is the obvious, the form factors. There are two distinct form factors going on here. In the T-series, as you might say, we have the hot shoe duplication. So you plug it into your hot shoe and then you get a new hot shoe on top. The weird thing about this is if you get a Sony flash, you still have a generic Canon hot shoe on the top. So that's kind of annoying to me because one of the purposes for this, for some people at least, is to take this, put it on top of your camera, and then mount another flash on top. It's a little janky, but it serves some purposes. Like, perhaps you have a flash that you like that isn't great for controlling transmission. The V1 is pretty good for that, but a lot of Godox's other flashes really bad interface for that sort of thing. Or perhaps you have a Canon flash that you want to use on a Sony body, then you can control other flashes while also using that Canon flash. Generally speaking though, I do not recommend this because this just adds extra weight and wiggle room to your hot shoe. It's not great. You can also use it though. Let's say you have a wireless transmitter. So this is my remote shutter that I use for real estate photography. I am still sticking with this as opposed to infrared, app-based, or Bluetooth-based transmitters because they just don't work as well as this thing does. It plugs right into your camera's multi-port and this can transmit further. Sometimes I have to get out of the room entirely to get out of the way of the shot. So anyway, enough about that. So that's why you would use this port on top. You could also put another transmitter on top from another company, so another system. But then, in the Pro Series, you don't have that capability. Additionally, when you mount these on top of your camera, for me, the T-Series has always been my favorite. And I'll say that right now, because as a wedding and event photographer, for the most part, when I have a camera hanging off of my holster, the amount that it sticks out at the top is actually pretty significant. Not so much this year, but a lot of the time I'll be squeezing through cramped reception halls and event spaces, and when I have this on the hot shoe, all of a sudden my camera is catching on chairs and people and tablecloths as I walk through the room, and it is surprisingly annoying to me. So if you want something that is low key and low profile, the 1T is still the smallest. The X2T has the same profile, but it sticks out a little bit further. You'll also observe that the X1T and the X-Pro original have a twist lock 
that rotates several times to lock it down, whereas the X2T and the R2 Pro 2 have a rapid twist lock that you just turn a half a turn to lock in position. Some people like one or the other. Most, I think, prefer the rapid twist lock. Now, ergonomically speaking, they have made some obvious changes here. So the X2T is specifically designed to be managed with one hand on one side and your other hand on your camera. So you can operate the quick buttons up top here with your thumb, or you can use your fingers. That's a little inconvenient because you can't quite see them. But you can rotate the wheel and change your settings that way while you're doing that. However, the 1T is kind of designed to be managed with the camera hand, which is not super convenient. And so you kind of have to cross over the screen, and that, that's kind of an obvious uh, fix that they did when they went to the 2T, because, yeah, that's weird. <laughs> now when we go to the Pro Series, all of a sudden we have, similar to the X2T, you have shortcuts along the side for each of your groups, which is quite convenient that way. And then you have a wheel here for controlling power level instead of the wheel underneath. Honestly, I find that the wheels on the T-Series controllers are much easier to manipulate, whereas this one, there's a button in the middle and it's not that responsive. And you have pretty much the same wheel on the R2 Pro. Again, on the Pros, another obvious thing is you have a lot more buttons. There are dedicated buttons on here for TCM. And then on the Pro 2, you have so many buttons. This is both a plus and a minus. The biggest minus for the Pro 2 is that instead of buttons lining up and matching up with your groups on the side here, the groups are down here around the wheel, A, B, C, D, E, which is not the most intuitive place to put them. Instead, you have these buttons along the side that are lock and beep and zoom. Having a dedicated button for zoom can be great if you're into that. Also a dedicated button for modeling lamps. That is fantastic to have that. But interestingly, there's a test button here and a test button here. There's a high speed sync button here and a high speed sync button here, an all button here and an all button here. The lamp button is the same as the mod button, so that's repeated as well. There's a lot of duplicated buttons on here. Now this can be convenient when you're inside a flash individually and changing that, but overall, it's just clutter. And the most annoying thing about this transmitter is that when you want to change the A, if you're used to this, the X2, or this, the Pro, you expect the button beside the A to select the A group. Instead, it immediately locks your flash controller. This is the most terrible user interface choice I think Godox has ever made. The button right next to the A group, the group you're most likely to use, immediately locks your flash controller. Now, if this is your only flash controller, you will eventually get used to that, and having these buttons a little further down here will prevent you from having to put your hand that far up. But overall, muscle memory for this is not as easy to learn. There is not a significant difference in the weight between these, except for the Pro 2 is somewhat obviously heavier. So that's our form factors down. We've already nibbled a bit into the feature set though, so let's jump fully into the feature sets and see how those differentiate our products. Let's have a look at a little chart here. That's right, we're going full Excel on this bad boy. The first flash controller, the X1T, is missing a lot of features that the other ones have. So as you can see, we don't have rear curtain sync, not a common thing to use. We don't have individual group buttons. We have USB micro instead of USB-C. You can't control modeling lamps with it. And you can't control zoom with it. You can't control Bluetooth devices with it. So it's missing a lot of stuff. It has the basics, but there have been a lot of features added since then. When we go to the next flash that they released, suddenly you have the ability to control up to 16 groups. You've got USB-C connectivity. You don't have backlit buttons yet, but we add the ability to use channel IDs. So this is above and beyond choosing our wireless channel. So currently this is a wireless channel one. That's the same thing as a Wi-Fi channel on the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. But you can also add a digital ID. 
Now, personally, I'm not a huge fan of this. What that does is it prevents other people using Godox flashes from triggering or controlling your flashes. 99.9% .9 of the time, this serves no purpose at all. And honestly, most of the time, this is to the detriment of the users. Most people don't understand this feature and accidentally change the ID inside their transmitters or inside their flash units and get stuck and can no longer control their system. So that's a plus and a minus. It adds extra complexity, but it can be useful. But another thing that we get with this new controller is this nice, big, beautiful screen. And so you can easily see all your flash groups, or at least all the ones that I have created right here, and select and swap between them by pressing these quick buttons. Speaking of quick buttons, the X2T kept this as well, but you have a smaller screen. You're back to only being able to control five groups, and that's kind of a problem with the small screen, just goes up to E. You lose the ability to do TCM, which the Pro introduced, TCM being you can use a TTL shot and convert that back into a solid manual exposure from your flashes. So you can fire once with the TCM function, there's a hot button right on there, and your TTL will translate back and tell you what the flash power was, and then you can continue using that for consistency. Because TTL can be unreliable, but a way of defeating that is you can take a few TTL shots, and then once you get one that you like, you can stick with that. Now, me personally, I almost never use TTL, so this is not much of an issue for me. And while the X2T does allow you to control the zoom of flashes, it's in a limited manner compared to the Pro series. But one big upgrade that the X2T brought was the ability to use Bluetooth, where you can sync it to an iPad or an iPhone and then use that to control your flashes. Now, why would I want to do that, you'd say? Well, for the most part, there's no great reason for that. But in a studio setting, it can look interesting and look professional to your clients. If you have an iPad by the side that allows you to control those things, or if you have a lot of flashes set up, it might be easier to control. But personally, I found it kind of buggy. Sometimes it works well, sometimes the flashes don't respond, and then you end up in a bit of a loop of trying to adjust something and it not responding, and your iPad says one thing, but the flash says the other. Don't like using it, but some people love that feature. You can also use it to tether to a smartphone camera and have the smartphone fire the flash for its own exposures. Now, utility here is highly limited, and so I don't want to talk too much about that because that would be a whole other rabbit hole. I have enough rabbit holes to go down already. Let's go to the R2 Pro 2. So this has almost all the features, it's just lacking a hot shoe. So as you can see, you have the 0.1 stop increments, you have USB-C, you've got Bluetooth, you've got dedicated group buttons, and honestly, the one and only for me headline feature of this. Are you ready? You can enable and disable groups by double tapping their group button. This is both the best feature of this and the most frustrating feature of this because this could be something that they could implement in most of their flash controllers, except for the X1T, but they don't. Just a small firmware update would allow me to press one of these buttons twice and activate or deactivate this channel. And I believe that a pre-release version of the X2T had this capability, but the final version, the current firmware, does not. Ugh, super annoying. Now one note about the features of this, if you are a Sony user, and Godox is very common for Sony because they filled out the ecosystem before a lot of other people did for Sony, they do not work well for autofocus assist. These do have autofocus assist lamps on them, but at best you can get them to work in AFS single shot. And single shot's not great on Sony cameras. For 99% of work, you want to be in AFC and then these assist lamps don't really work. And standard infrared assist lamps also don't work on Sony because the sensor on Sony mirrorless cameras, the autofocus sensors themselves, don't see infrared. So there's nothing for them to see. The ones that paint as this one can, if you have it set up properly in AFS, it will paint a hash mark pattern. Yeah, it works, but it has limited utility as low light autofocus performance is significantly worse in AFS. So you're trading off low light autofocus performance to get your autofocus assist beam. So I just don't use them. And then the final comparison is the price. Now it used to be that the Pro 2 was the most expensive, but now it's the same price. 
as the Pro. So if you want that Bluetooth, you want those uh, double tapping buttons, you like that big, big screen that can actually, has one more setting, it makes everything even bigger. And I actually like that. There's almost no reason to not use the large numbers on this. Very easy to see, easy to use. So these are both $70. 10 bucks less, this guy right here, the two. And way down at $46 is the one. So honestly, between these three, it's mostly just your own preferences for form factor and usability. I do not want to say that there's a best one among these. I'm actually not going to call a winner or a loser here. They are different. They are different options for different people and different workflows. Let me get that out of the way right now. You do not need to be ashamed for buying the X1T. For some people, it's the best choice. Similarly, you might not necessarily need the Pro 2. It's bigger, does more, but has some caveats. So let's move on so we can find those caveats. Next up, I decided to figure out if there's any difference in the transmission power of these flash transmitters. So let's get outside and let's see what we can find out. Okay, so here, or rather way down there, I have my flash. It's about 100 feet away from where I am now. I have markings in the snow every 25 feet back to my flash. I have an 8100 Pro mounted, mostly just because it's very round and very plasticky. So we'll see how far these transmitters actually go. I have the uh, snow measured out to 125 feet. These are supposed to go 100 feet. It'll probably go further. At least I think it will. Okay. I am 200 meters away, about 600 feet. And I've just tested all four controllers and they all work fine at this distance. Even with Bluetooth turned on and an increased load on the batteries, they all work fine. Did not expect that. We're gonna have to go farther. <sighs> all right, so obviously we're gonna have to step things up a bit and uh, take more drastic measures. <sighs> okay, let's hit it. Can you say 250 meters? No. Why not? Jeez. Okay, so I went as far away as I possibly could in any straight stretch that I could find. Unless I go out to the highway, I got to 250 meters and they all worked. How far was that? Oh, okay. So as you can see, the original plan to test the manufacturer's stated 100 meter range turned out to be a complete failure because 100 meters was not even remotely accurate. It was highly conservative. So I had to go all the way out onto the highway to test this. I had to find the longest stretch of road I could find because at 600 meter distance, the furthest that I could see my flash going off, these were still working fine in a straight stretch outside. So how did we do? Well, the X-Pro2 Although you might expect it to be the powerhouse, the most powerful, because it is using the most power, its distance, its maximum range is limited. Because that big screen, the big controls, the button backlights, they're using so much power already that it's drawing power away from the transmitter, it would seem. I wouldn't be surprised if they had all the same transmitter module, but just have different constraints on the power systems that are influencing the ranges. And because battery choice for these is highly controversial, I decided to test various types of batteries in these, fully charged, to see what the distance effects are. So as you can see in this chart right here, the X-Pro2 uniformly underperformed pretty much everything across the board. And whether or not you had alkaline, nickel metal hydride, or lithium didn't make a huge difference, at least at this range, because I wasn't really getting to the limits of it. I felt that at 600 meters, we were pushing it. They weren't super reliable if it went beyond that, but at that range, it just doesn't matter anymore. And 
it's hard to tell if the flash is firing any further than that. So as you can see, nickel metal hydride is a little less reliable, and I found that these lithium rechargeable cells, and I'll talk a little bit more about those later, were the most reliable for long distances. So what's going on under the hood here? I talked about power consumption, let's look closer at that. I cracked out a bunch of powerful multimeters, and oh boy, I got a lot of data. So the first thing that we really want to do is just look at this chart here. In different conditions for these flashes, they consume obviously different amounts of power. And what I expected was that maybe this will use more. But what I did not expect is that the X-Pro, not two, just one, in most conditions uses the least amount of power. It was really surprising to me. So when firing with the display off, so just the backlight not lit, which is how it will operate most of the time when you're firing your flash, it is using less power. But why does that matter? Well, if you have batteries in here, the batteries are going to last longer than in the other flash modules, even longer than in the X1T, this little guy right here. This really surprised me. Now measuring the current doesn't give you the full story. You also have to measure the input voltage, because that tells you the actual power consumption in watts. So if we take all of that and add in the voltage, we get the wattage, and these numbers kind of coalesce together here. Again, we're seeing that clearly the X-Pro is using less power. Now the most power that something can use is self-evidently using Bluetooth with the display backlight on while firing at high output. Because these can fire at both high and low, they all have that capability. If you're firing a flash inside your studio, you don't have a lot of interference, or you're very close to it, you want to set it to low output or near. But if you're out in the open or you do have a lot of interference to punch through and you're not right next to your flash, you can set that to a further distance and it uses more power. Not significantly more though, as you can see in these charts. I'll have a link to a, a better doc that you can go through on this in the description. So overall, the one takeaway we can get from these charts is that the X-Pro2 uses the most power and generally speaking, the X-Pro uses the least. So if you want those batteries to last, that's what you know. So we tested these with fully charged alkaline, fully charged lithium ion, and fully charged nickel metal hydride, as well as depleted nickel metal hydride. Because if you have followed some of the controversy of these flashes, it's generally accepted that they don't behave well with nickel metal hydride rechargeable batteries, and that is unfortunate. And the manual says to use them only with alkaline batteries. So let's dig a little deeper into why that is. Let's look at the numbers. So as you can see here, in the power consumption, the nickel metal hydride batteries hold up great. They are outputting the same, if not more power to these flash units. So when these need a surge of power to hit the flash, to fire that transmitter, nickel metal hydride does a great job of doing that. And if we go in and test the hit rate of these, if you're in a normal condition with very little interference, they all do great. I fired this thing 2,500 times, and I only had one missed shot, and that was with the half-charged nickel metal hydrides in the Pro 2. So the flash unit that demands the most power from the lowest charge nickel metal hydride had one error, so that gave us a 99.79% hit rate. The others were 100%, so there you have it. I would have to do this so many times, and probably with more interference, to show any more failings from the nickel metal hydride batteries. Based on those numbers, statistically speaking, there doesn't seem to be any issue here. But if we look closer at the power draw, let's zoom in a little bit here. When we get to the 1.2 volt nickel metal hydrides, and honestly, they're still going strong at that point, there's a lot of power left in the battery that it can put out. But if we normalize for voltage times current, which gives us actual power usage, when we're under a high rapid load, all of a sudden, on fire high, the nickel metal hydride batteries are consuming more power. So we've got 110 milliwatts, where the other ones are only consuming 72, 67. So that's strange. So obviously the circuit seems to be struggling to get enough power out of this, and things aren't behaving properly. It's drawing more out than it normally would. But then, when we get to the highest power draw, that is firing the high output, with the backlight on and the Bluetooth running, so this is the most power that this can possibly consume, it's giving out the least amount of power. Again, by a reasonable margin. So that's telling me that this battery isn't holding up its end of the bargain in this particular case. 
Although, yes, I believe that the nickel metal hydride batteries, even good ones, aren't ideal for these flash triggers, I think that the hype of them being flawed is oversold. They're not the best that you can do. The alkaline and the lithium ion battery cells are going to do better, but only marginally so. Where you're going to see the most improvement, the most useful and significant thing you can do, and I buried the lead in this video, I didn't even put it in the feature set, is channel scan. You need to make sure you don't have interference when you're firing these flashes. So in the X2T and the X-Pro2, as well as in the Godox V1, you have the ability to scan your channels. This is incredibly useful and important, depending on where you are. Now, in my house here, in my studio, very little interference. But I have done shoots at locations where the entire base Wi-Fi spectrum, such as at call centers and uh, event centers and hotels, is just completely congested, and these are not going to work well. Now it's important to note that the channel scan feature is not a smart feature. Now I'm not saying that it's not smart to use it, but that it doesn't give you the full picture. So the channels that it shows you are the best possible options. Unfortunately, that can mean the, it's the best of uniformly terrible options and none of them will actually work very well because you have too much interference. Or it could mean that you have tons and tons of great options and these just happen to be the best of those, but channel 1 and other things that aren't mentioned there will still work fine. Unfortunately, it doesn't show you the actual decibel or reception levels, just which ones came out on top. If you want to see that, you're going to have to download an Android app like a Wi-Fi scanner that will give you the actual information on all the available channels. Unfortunately, this can't be done on iPhone or iOS because that API is just not made available by Apple. Again, your battery choice is much less significant than your wireless channel choice. Because in the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, you've got Wi-Fi, you've got microwaves, you've got pacemakers, and medical devices. It's a highly congested spectrum. You want to get your channels right. That being said, if these get down in power, in voltage, just like if these get down in voltage, if you see that battery thing blinking, or even if it's just down to one bar, that means your voltage is low enough that it's not going to be outputting the full power, it's going to be struggling, the circuitry might not be working properly, replace your batteries. So which batteries are the best? Should you use alkaline or rechargeable lithium ion? That's a tough one. I found that overall in my testing, the rechargeable lithium ion worked the best. But there is a huge but with these. Because of the way the circuitry in this is designed, the cell inside is actually 3.7 volts, and then it's stepped down to 1.5. Because of that design, this always puts out exactly 1.4 to 1.5 volts, depending on its temperature. And so, when it reaches the end of its battery life, the drop-off from 1.4 to 1.5 to unusable voltage is incredibly rapid. You do not get warning that this battery is dying. So although the battery life meter on the nickel metal hydride isn't accurate, it hovers around two bars, and then one bar, and then blinks. You know to get rid of it when it starts to blink right away. And the battery life indicator with the alkalines is entirely linear, so you can trust it there. So that's a bit of a tough call. I have found that I can get weeks or even months of use out of these lithium ion batteries, like even more than an alkaline battery. So they are very reliable, but it's a bit chancy because you don't know how much is left. That's why I used the lithium ion batteries for my testing, because they worked the best. I knew they were fully charged. They're the most reliable, generally speaking. But unfortunately, I still have to recommend that if you want the best, most reliable, most consistent, most predictable performance from these flash triggers, you've got to use the alkalines. I was hoping that perhaps the X1T had a significantly smaller enough power draw that it didn't matter, but I suspect that they all have very similar circuitry in here. They just, some have more things attached to that circuitry that can draw more power. So there you have it. Which one do you think is the perfect one? Which one do you use? Which one do you hate? 
But let me know if you have any questions about these down in the comments. I'll answer you down below. If you want to buy one of these, please use my affiliate links because again, I want this channel to succeed. I have links down in the description for those. So until next time, where I'm going to be talking about the chargers themselves, also incredibly nerdy way. Go take some photos.